Hey everyone, Barely Alec, back again. I really appreciate all the support on the last Whetstone video. Like, that was actually insane. But now I have to do this challenge Nile too. So, I'm feeling some mixed emotions here. Looks like Beppy isn't the only clown, since I gave my wonderful viewers the decision of which of the three initially available bosses to fight. And of course they chose the one that I thought might be impossible under my rule set that also bans dashing. I got a lot of comments asking why I banned that, and we're about to see firsthand why this rule makes things a lot more interesting, and way harder. But I'm getting ahead of myself here, let's start with phase 1. Here's a real high class bout! In this phase, Beppy's riding a bumper car as ducks move from right to left in the middle of the screen. Beppy inches forwards or backwards for about 3 seconds before charging into the side of the screen and turning around to repeat this process again. It's worth noting that his hitbox shrinks during this animation. I promise I'm not cheating. The ducks are the biggest threat here since I can't just dash under them while being above Beppy, but they can be whetstone to make them twirl, disabling their hitbox. Since we don't know exactly when Beppy's going to charge forwards, I constantly clear them until I see him pull back to telegraph the charge. I either parry off of Beppy's head to get a hit while he passes me, or parry a duck to safely avoid the attack if whetstoning Beppy would have resulted in me getting hit by the duck. The most common time to get hit though is during the 3-ish seconds before his charge. It's a bit awkward since you don't know if he's moving forward or pulling back, but if we line up our hits with the assumption that he'll move forward, we hit him if he does that and simply land on the ground again to readjust for another hit or dodge if he moves backwards. We also have to clear ducks during this if they're going to interfere with our hits or Beppy's charge. Ducks holding light bulbs take top priority to hit or run under here since they drop light bulbs on us for damage. That's pretty much it for this phase, it's really easy and I can consistently beat it without getting hit. Phase 2 isn't that bad either, but it's slightly worse than the first. Beppy's head fully inflates and is stationary on the top middle of the screen, which has a generous hurtbox, fortunately without a hitbox, so we can actually parry off of him without taking damage. The attack we have to look out for is the balloon dogs that spawn in groups of 2 to 4 at a time. These are typically easy to avoid since we can gain height by hitting the boss to go over and around them. The only complication is when the roller coaster goes by since it can damage us by ramming into cup- I'm sorry, lame stupid mug man. And once we're on it, we have to avoid the passengers which can put us in unwinnable situations if the balloons block our jumps. There's no dominant strategy here, we just have to try to dodge whatever patterns we get, which sometimes requires some precise short hops. We can still get some damage on the boss as the roller coaster goes by while potentially using that height to dodge, but we mainly get as many attacks as possible while it's in the background. Now for the real reason this boss is the hardest fight in this challenge so far, and undoubtedly the hardest thing I've attempted in any challenge run. The stupid donkey. The attacks aren't particularly threatening here. Attacking is. When I first tried this fight, it quickly became obvious that I needed more height to hit Beppy without getting hit myself. This is what I mean by not being able to dash making this challenge so much harder. If I could, I would simply whetstone under the donkey no matter which color it was and dash away before getting parried into a hitbox. Without dashing, we have to do something a little different. <sighs> Make sure the donkey's green since it's slightly closer to the ground, stand on the roller coaster as it's going by, wait for an opening between Charlie's attacks, line yourself to get ready to jump at the perfect moment, keeping in mind that you're on a moving platform and once you're there, hold jump till about when Mugman's reaching the indent between his mouth and nose. Start moving left while still holding jump, quickly let go of jump so you can press it again to wet zone bet beans, swiftly start holding right to front yourself from touching his hitbox and land ball avoiding any passengers in the way. Any questions? It's already bad that I have to do this 21 times during a single attempt, but you don't even know the half of it yet. Or should I say the quarter of it, since a donkey being green is a 50% chance, and it being on the left is another 50% chance, meaning it will only be in the right spot and right color 25% of the time. 
But it gets worse, don't you worry, since we also need the roller coaster to be passing by, and it spends more time off screen than on. And even if the roller coaster and Green Donkey are in the right places, it isn't uncommon that we won't be able to attack it since Charlie's horseshoes are in the way. So we can usually only get a hit or two every couple of minutes. I say or two because when everything aligns, it can semi often do so in a way where we can attack again, since the horseshoe attacks always happen twice before Beppy goes back off screen, and the short period of time between the two attacks and after the last attack gives us our opening. And even though the attacks themselves aren't too threatening, we'll be on this phase for a long time, greatly increasing our odds of getting hit. The yellow donkey's attacks are the easiest to avoid. If the coaster isn't on screen and won't be when the horseshoes hit the ground, just run under Charlie since they never fall there. If the coaster's on screen, just know that the attack always leaves an opening to get on it. So as long as you don't parry the nose, you'll be able to jump to safety. There are also times where you have to make the split second decision to jump on the roller coaster right before Charlie shoots or wait until right after the horseshoes go off screen and jump on the roller coaster right before it collides into you. Either way, it's a very short window if you get unlucky with how the attacks overlap. The green donkey is much harder to avoid, but is usually manageable. As long as the roller coaster isn't in the foreground, you can easily stand between where it arcs, or simply duck, which actually completely avoids the attack. This one gets a lot trickier to avoid if the roller coaster is approaching right as it starts, as you'll sometimes have to arc your jump over the front of the cart and under the horseshoes. Occasionally jumping over the passengers will also have this problem, but you'll sometimes be able to parry the one pink horseshoe to avoid having to go under, which is a little easier. This phase taking so long means that you'll almost certainly be forced to dodge at least a couple of bad patterns like this. You might be wondering why I can't just hit Beppy if the green donkey's on the right, and the simple answer is that I actually can. Nothing about the whetstone hit becomes impossible, just much, much harder. If only it were as easy as hitting that subscribe button. Sorry. In order to hit him on the right, we have to be moving against the roller coaster, which might seem easier at first, since I can just use a visual cue from the background to always jump at the same time, since moving against the coaster is slower than standing still on it, giving me more reaction time than hitting on the left. But the big flaw with this strategy is that the passengers get more in the way, since I now have to constantly jump over them as I adjust the whetstone hit, but I don't have a lot of time to do that with Charlie attacking again. Even if I do get the hit, I'm more likely to land on a passenger, since on the left side I would always be able to stand in front of a passenger cart before attacking Beppy to avoid them on my way down. Now's probably a good time to mention that the passengers are three carts apart from each other and there are three total carts with them on the roller coaster. There isn't much more to say about this phase. At first, I was lucky to get a single hit on Beppy without getting hit in return. Then I'd be able to get two or three. Until eventually, I would be able to get about 14 hits on the boss before dying, which was incredible progress that took hours and hours to achieve. Although, some of those hits came from invincibility frames cut Mugman gets from messing up the hit or getting hit and taking damage on the way back down. While invincible, you can get two free hits on Beppy to give us a bit more room for error. And after even more hours and hours of practice, stream after stream, dead brain cell after dead brain cell. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna try axing a clown in real life just to see how easy it is compared to the game, but we'll see. I finally got to phase 4, which I think speaks for itself. Oh, oh my god. Okay, everyone shut up. Everyone be quiet. Everybody stop talking. Oh! We're fine.
God. There are so many close moments there. <laughs> My heart races every time I watch that clip, but I guess we're not getting out of clown hell that easily. I really don't want to lose phase 4 after getting there again since it took over 30 hours to get a single attempt that far. And even though it's Beppy's second hardest phase for this challenge in my opinion, it's still overall a relatively easy phase if we consider some of the other bosses we've already fought as well. We need to hit Beppy 53 times here. We can get 6 hits on him before the roller coaster comes into the foreground. It's much faster now and has passengers in every other cart, so falling down while it's here is pretty much up to luck on whether or not we get hit, so I recommend not falling down. After it leaves, Beppy will spit out penguins and we can hit him while he does. Once I see one stop rolling and end up on the right side of the screen, I jump and ride the carousel over to it, fall down the platform, and whetstone the penguin. Fortunately, they only take one hit of whetstone to die. I also parry the other one that spawns on the right side, unless it doesn't spawn here since the locations and amount of penguins are semi-random. Sometimes these or another penguin spawns just to the right of Beppy's hurt box, which makes him hard to hit since being slightly off means hitting Beppy instead. I recommend immediately running back if this happens, since it's about to throw a baseball and the roller coaster is on its way back, making it too risky. The reason I specified to be on the right side instead of the left is simply that the carousel platforms are a little closer to the ground, making them easier to jump on, especially after parrying a penguin. The baseballs they throw are very annoying and can absolutely ruin a good run since they sometimes throw it directly at where you are, and sometimes where you're about to go. I like to stay on the ground to bait as many shots down there as possible while giving me an out by jumping on a platform which also avoids a roller coaster if it's close. You'll have to be prepared to do some tight jumps if they throw baseballs while you're already on the carousel, but usually this will only hurt your already accelerating heart rate. We simply repeat this process, getting roughly 6 to 8 hits on Beppy between penguin spawns depending on how quickly one gets summoned on the right side for me to focus on clearing. And even though it took me about 30 hours to get to phase 4 the first time, it took another 25 to 30 hours to get back. That's how brutal phase 3 is. I even tried using tape to give me a better visual cue for when to jump, which helps a bit, but not much since Charlie's mouth is already a pretty good one. And I get that this might be a grey area for some people on whether or not this is cheating. I think it's fair since it's not modifying the game and is something you could accidentally replicate pretty easily. Like what if there's a dirty spot on your computer screen that just so happened to be a good visual cue for this jump or maybe like a crack or something? Uh, would that be cheating? I, I don't know. If you think it's cheating, let me know in the comments and I still won't refight Beppy. I don't want to undersell how tough that phase is, but I also don't have much more to say other than that it's really, 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 really hard, which doesn't make for the most entertaining video. So without further ado, Here's my second time making it past phase 3 in a real attempt. Oh. Okay, it's one out. Okay, everyone shut up. Everybody shut up. Oh my goodness. One. Twenty-eight. 29, 30, 7, Yes! Oh my god! Yes! Oh my god! Beppy, the clown went down. 
<laughs> yes! Yes! Oh my god. That was so risky at the end. I didn't know if I should have gone for... If I should have cleared her, I should have just kept attacking. I wasn't sure if I had count, but I knew it was so close. And I just went for it. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. It, the victory quote... Um... Crap. Um... Can you tell I spent 50 hours on this? I didn't even... Um... You're a clown. Yet you make me frown. You... <laughs> He's such... He, looks like you're not the only clown... Here. <laughs> so... Can you believe it? That was my third try? <laughs> thank you so much for the 15... Whatever those were. Oh, and thank you so much for the $15! I said do it! Take it! Thanks for... And Saggy for the 15... Things. Uh, for the effort. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the clown is dead. I bet, I bet people feel pretty stupid right about now if they voted otherwise. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Ten memberships? No, no, you madman! Beppy gets his own tier for being that bad. What else is there to say? After Beppy, I gave my audience a choice of which boss to fight next, and then proceeded to not listen to them. I mean, you saw what happened last time I did that, right? So, Baroness von Bonbon, it is. It's on! Her fight is unique in that her first three phases pull from five possible mini-bosses, with the third one being the most difficult since the Baroness shoots at you while you still have to deal with the mini boss. I would always reset to fight the Waffle or Gumball Machine first since they're the hardest mini bosses, which confused a lot of people. My reasoning for this is that if I fought either of them in phase 3, they would be almost impossible to consistently dodge in conjunction with the Baroness's attack. And while I think the Gumball Machine is the hardest Phase 3 mini-boss, it isn't very time efficient to reset for a 20% chance when the Waffle is almost as difficult. Let's go over each mini-boss individually, starting with Sergeant Gumbo Gumball. He runs back and forth across the screen and only has one attack, but it's a tough one. He shoots Gumballs into the air for them to fall down in various patterns. Jelly Bullies are constantly being summoned, and since this is expert mode, they start spawning on the first mini boss, so we'll have to worry about them constantly. These little guys run out of the castle to the left until off screen. Without being able to duck and shoot them, they can put us in undodgeable situations, but most of the time, if you're paying attention, can be dodged or parried off of while avoiding the mini boss. Since Sergeant Gumbo Gumball's attacks fall down from the top of the screen, it's tough to hit him while it's happening, but there are some openings I can take advantage of to speed this phase up. Between attacks, I can get about 3-5 to five hits on average, but they aren't exactly easy to land either since the green candy platform can get in the way here. It's a bit awkward, but I can drop down it to land an attack. Sir Waffington III is the second hardest mini boss in my opinion and I just realized. That's, it's a little bit funny that the third is the second. Now cut that out. This is mostly due to his movement pattern being a very fast and very poorly drawn circle that will change to follow the player. This makes it so he can ram into us if we're not careful. But what makes this worse is that we don't know exactly when he'll use his attack, which can trap us. This has him randomly shoot his pieces in the four cardinal directions or diagonally. Whichever one he didn't start with, he'll do second before returning to his normal movement pattern. You usually want to find the sweet spot between the two possible attacks to safely dodge both, but since we don't know exactly when, where, and which attack he'll start with, he'll constantly be adjusting, sometimes performing some tight dodges between the two attacks. You can't actually damage him while he's attacking, so just focus on dodging. But if you need to, you can still parry the pieces of Sir Waffington III, this can be useful when Jelly Bullies get in the way, 
These minions are most dangerous when we have to dodge the attack in a way that we're forced to hide right next to the castle, which sometimes happens against this specific miniboss. Mufsky Chernikov was tough to figure out at first, but not so bad when I got used to him. His only attack is to jump around the screen, hitting the sides and top of it to land back on the ground, and splash frosting three times from both sides of him. There's a small opening where you can jump between the miniboss and frosting, but I don't recommend going out of your way to land there. Instead, use the green candy platform as our go-to safe spot. When Mufsky Chernikov lands below or near it, drop down and immediately land back on it to avoid the frosting. Then move or don't move in whatever way you need to so as to avoid the next jump from the boss. I almost always go for my own attacks in situations like this, which often requires a bit of waiting for the jumps and platform to be in the right spot. Colonel Von Pop is the second easiest miniboss for me. He moves in a predictable pattern across the screen, with the only thing you need to pay attention to is if he moves up or down when he's in the middle of the screen. If not, be prepared to jump over him and get a whetstone hit on your way. His only attack is to summon his minions who fly upwards until they leave the screen. This is typically harmless, but if Colonel Von Pop is feeling extra mean, he'll summon one right where you're going for you to take damage to. I recommend waiting to hit this boss until you know you're safe to hold left or right and land safely after hitting him. I generally stay on the left so I have more time to react to the jelly bullies. Lord Gobpacker is the easiest mini boss in my opinion. All he does is follow the player while ignoring gravity, which is only made slightly more complicated due to the two minions that trail behind him. These can be jumped between, and I like to run around in a circle while parrying off of Lord Gobpacker when possible. The moving platform gives us an easy safe spot to land and baits the boss upwards. The most common time I would get hit by it is when a jelly bully gets in the way, or if this is a phase 3 mini boss. Any mini boss being the third one has them become much more difficult than they would be otherwise. For most of them, you can bait Baroness's attack upwards by jumping off the candy platform so you have enough space to dodge both it and the mini boss. And even though I would reset to fight one of the two hardest mini bosses first to lower my odds of running into them last, Baroness just loved to summon them then. Of course, it's my mortal enemy. A gumball machine. Sergeant Gumbo Gumball and Sir Waffington III are exceptions to my normal strategy since their movement patterns and attacks can corner you right into the Baroness's attack. So I try to always keep in mind when she's about to shoot and play around it as best as I can. Ideally, being able to bait it to the top of the screen like usual. The attack can also be parried off of, since the clouds have health, which can help too. That just leaves phase 4, where Baroness Von Bonbon yanks on the castle to make it chase the player. Her main attack is to throw her head, which will periodically home onto you. It does this 6 times after the initial throw, which is important to know as I actually keep track of how many times it's done so, to know when it's going to leave the screen, since right after it homes in on the last time, it briefly stops before continuing in that direction until it's gone. This wouldn't be so bad on its own if not for her being able to use this attack again while one head is already chasing you. This can make it hard to keep count, but as long as you know how many times the first head has homed in onto you, you can use that knowledge to know that the second head will home into you that many more times before going off screen itself. Too bad that's not the only thing we have to worry about though, since the castle spits out Patsy Menthols pretty often on Expert. These can be parried to give us some more movement options, but more often get in the way of me dodging the heads, and can make me lose count. Uh oh, we also have to hit the boss, uh oh snap! We can get about 6 to 8 hits on her safely while the phase transition is happening. If we wanted to play more greedily, I would go for an extra 2 after the castle starts moving, but she can throw her head right after that starts if she wants to, so I don't recommend it. Most of our 34 hits will come from slight openings in her attacks. If a Patsy Menthol is about to roll out, which has the tell of the mouth opening beforehand, I can't attack, 
but if that's not the case and the heads are also not in the way, preferably after she just threw one so she can't do it again, I can get a parry or two on the boss before I run left again to focus on dodging. So a majority of this phase is spent dodging the heads. Baiting them to the left is a good way to open up my dodging options, and the candy platform helps a ton too. This attack makes this the hardest phase of this fight, but after getting used to counting and dodging, this happened. Oh my god, two health? I think that's the first two health victory! Oh my god! I almost don't believe it's actually over because of that. I was like, it can't be over, I have two health. <laughs> okay, but I also didn't pick a victory quote. Everyone say a victory quote right now if you want me to say it. Um, all I got is, first they're sweet, and then they're dead. Um, uh, off with your head, and now you're dead. Um, that is candy. Candy. I have nothing. I've got nothing. You, I, there are so many good ones that you guys said. You're sweet, now you're beat. There, perfect. Uh, so I'll edit that into the video. Baroness von Bonbon goes in medium difficulty, since her only truly difficult phase is the final one. That, and I was somehow able to win with 2 health left. Before getting to the next boss, let's take a break with a running gun. I don't need coins from them anymore, but I also don't need to beat the game whetstone only, so... The easier one for this challenge is Funfair Fever. The first difficult part is the falling platforms, as we can only slowly kill the robot monkeys and cannon wall, but by patiently waiting for the cannon shots, you can switch platforms and get all the hits you need to progress. The shooting range always leaves the spot to safely stand, so it's no issue, allowing you to get to the worst part of the level. This has jumping pretzels that I don't like walking under, as condiments get fired from the right side of the screen that often block the path. I slowly make my way forward and whetstone the pretzels, ready to jump back to the previous platform to dodge condiments. You'll need at least two health to use invincibility frames to get past the haunt dog. Fortunately, I had one left over from Baroness Von Bonbon. Bon. So, remember last time where I didn't listen to my audience so I could fight the easiest boss I had available? Well, it looks like I should have just listened to them in the first place because to Jimmy is Basically a joke. Oops. It's on. The most vital thing to know about his first phase is that he only does the skull attack twice per attempt, and then never does it again. This is important because to Jimmy's hitbox extends behind him whenever he does this attack for some reason, so without shrinking we take damage to this weird hitbox. But after he's done the skull attack twice, we're safe to just stay behind a Jimmy to hit him since Whetstone does in fact hit in a circle around Mugman. This just leaves three possible attacks that to Jimmy can use in this phase. Once he picks one, he'll only use it until the phase is over from you beating it or dying. Jewels are the worst attack since they prevent us from hitting to Jimmy while we dodge them and can hit us too quickly to dodge consistently, so I would always reset when seeing them. Cats are okay, but they will home on to us while behind the boss, and the sarcophagus opening can block our path. Eventually, I found that it's most efficient to just reset for swords, since they take a long time to launch towards us and can easily be dodged, making them go off screen unlike the constant homing of the cats. This allows us to spam whetstone, since like with Hilda, hitting a whetstone in a plane level dramatically reduces its cooldown in comparison to missing it. 
This is great for the phase transition too, since damage done here carries over to Dejimi's sarcophagus phase. And it's about to be necessary, since the pillar phase requires us to break the ones with Dejimi's face on them to get through without taking damage. A lot of people asked how I was going to do this phase specifically. Just hit them twice. I, I guess people thought they had more health or something. I mean, I don't know. The phase still isn't easy since we have to avoid the sauce as usual, which sometimes takes long enough without shrinking to force us to ram into the pillar thanks to this phase being an auto scroller. As I improved, this became more uncommon to the point that I would try to hit both pillars with the face on them as long as I was ahead of the auto scroll enough, since damage here also carries over to the sarcophagus phase which is by far the worst one what stone only, and the only reason I consider this fight at all challenging. The problem is, this phase just isn't designed for melee combat. I know, shocking. Dejimi's attack is to launch his eyes in an up and down pattern which damages the player, but if you're the perfect distance from Dejimi, they won't hit you when just being launched, so we're saved, right? Not quite. He also summons mummies from the sarcophagus, and we don't have time to dodge them if they're summoned right in front of us. I tried for potential G spots like going behind the sarcophagus, and you can actually hit the Jimmy from the side, but like phase 1, his attack expands his hitbox behind him, resulting in us taking damage. Funnily enough, shrinking would prevent us from getting hit here too. Oh well. Without cheesing this phase, it's going to be very difficult to safely attack due to the overlap of Dejimi's attack and summons. The mummies take two hits to kill, which is already bad since they move so fast, but I also have to be mindful of where the eyes are at the same time. The middle of the screen is the most dangerous since Dejimi's eyes will always meet there, which leaves the top or bottom as my two options to stay at. While you might think there's no major difference between the two, the bottom of the screen is actually much safer since mummies very rarely spawn low enough to hit us while we hug my new best friend, the bottom of the screen. We can hit to Jimmy when he's also near the bottom as long as we know he's not about to attack due to him just doing so. Otherwise, just stay far enough away to dodge. This strategy takes a really long time to get any significant damage in, and isn't consistent enough to actually beat the face before dying to a tough attack pattern or odd mummies summon low enough to hit us. Even the extra damage that carries over from hitting to Jimmy between phases, hitting every totem, and the extra two hits at the start of the phase isn't enough to make this work. So it's time to channel my inner cuphead, even if I have to play Mugman, and roll the dice. Instead of disengaging after the first two hits, Double down and follow to Jimmy while mashing Whetstone. Again, as long as you're the right distance away from him, his eyes won't hit you, but a mummy spawning right where you are is basically a guaranteed hit. It's possible to dodge them if you're extremely quick, but sometimes they're hidden behind a Jimmy, so good luck dodging that. On a good attempt, I get here with 3 health and will almost always lose 1 or 2 if I get through, and that's still an if. It's about a 50-50 on surviving the phase or not, but it's well worth the reward of actually getting to the next one. And pretty quickly at that, as it takes about a minute and 30 seconds for a successful attempt to get through this phase. I've had a couple people ask if secret phases are allowed in this challenge, and I think they're fair game since you still get soul contracts for beating them. That being said, we can't do this one since it requires shrinking to activate. Cuppet's phase is a bit of a weird one. We're obviously going to stick to the right side of the screen to actually do damage, so the biggest threat is to Jimmy's hat chasing the player. Or, well, it would be if it didn't get stuck once we go above Cuppet. This will make things much easier, but eventually it will most likely get unstuck, which will complicate the phase a lot more. Before then, you can continuously attack Cuppet's cup which has a straight hit slash hurt box, contrary to how he slants it when shooting in front of himself like a dummy. The hat will still shoot bullets even when stuck, so sometimes you have to move to avoid them, and carefully reposition yourself to deal damage again. Once the hat frees itself, things get a lot more complicated, since every other spot is much more awkward to hit Cuppet, 
and will have fewer opportunities to do so. You have to be the most cautious when attacking behind or below Cuppet, since once the face transitions, he'll usually kick you, and even if he doesn't, dodging might make the hat hit you on its way out. Just be mindful of about how many hits you've got in this phase, so you can try to finish it above Cuppet for the most consistent escape. The final phase isn't that bad. It took a little getting used to the delay in the pyramid attack to know exactly which spots were safest and committing to going above or below them to wait out the beams. Other than that, Dijimi will periodically fire a three-ringed beam of his own at the player's current location. It's not really a threat if you just move, like, at all. So, the best spot for hitting him is lining up the plane's propeller on the bottom of his teeth. We'll consistently be forced to move in order to avoid his attacks, but we can get a lot of hits between them until... You can't defeat me, even without your wishes three. Um... Did Jimmy? More like... Add Jimmy? Um... Uh... Looks like... You'll need to... I, I wish for more... You should wish for more wishes, then use those more wishes to wish for my defeat. Uh... <laughs> Thanks for the GGs, everyone! That was only 3 minutes and 41 seconds? Let's go! <laughs> Second stream! I did not think the Jimmy would be that easy! The Jimmy is definitely one of the easier bosses for this challenge, though part of that is due to experience with the challenge, and even then, I do think he was harder than Goopy in the root pack. I still can't believe it only took 2 streams to beat him, though. Okay, no more voting or ignoring voting like the corrupt YouTuber I am. I'm saving Grim for last since I thought he'd be the second hardest boss of the aisle. I may or may not have been wrong about that. No more Grim tonight. I'm so done with Grim right now. Which leaves Wally Warbles as the only option to fight next. A brawl is surely brewing. Phase 1's main problem to solve is how we're going to consistently and ideally quickly hit Wally so we can get more attempts past the first phase. He moves up and down, but unlike Hilda, isn't safe to hit above or below since his head reaches both areas. And just in case anyone is wondering, you can't hit him anywhere besides his head, meaning there's no benefit to going behind him. So we're gonna have to find another way while ignoring his attacks and minions. These attacks are an egg that he shoots out of his mouth and shatters once reaching the back of the screen, with the shards bursting out in five directions. His other attack turns his head into a hand with three fingers that each shoot a large bullet in the direction they're facing. The minions in this fight often get in the way since four birds enter the screen at the player's current elevation and move from right to left. Thankfully, these die to a single parry. I tried strats that hug the top or bottom of the screen just in front of Wally so I could hit him while he couldn't hit me. Not only do birds get in the way, but if Wally decides to spit at his maximum or minimum height, I'll always get hit by his most common attack. His hand attack has a bigger delay between uses, and he never uses it twice in a row, which would always hit me if I was in one of these areas. But by being mindful of this cooldown, I could always avoid it by backing up if I knew it was coming soon. This attack might be the key to beating this phase though, since after using it, he has a brief delay before spitting his next egg. It's just under the amount of time it takes for him to move from one side of the screen to the other, and it's much longer than any other opportunity to attack him. 
So is that the best strategy? Wait roughly 20 seconds for hand shots to get in 2-5 to five hits each time while still avoiding everything else and sometimes taking damage while trying to line up whetstone hits? Nope. Notice how, unlike Hilda, Wally moves in a straight line up and down, unlike whatever she's doing. This means I can follow him straight up and down myself by using the D-pad instead of the joystick like I usually do on my controller. This is, of course, easier said than done. Wally's beak doesn't have a hitbox, but we'll still have to fly right in front of his head to hit him. Like with Hilda, we'll have to line it up in a way where we're just close enough to hit him with small adjustments potentially moving us right into his hitbox. So we always start the fight by trying to line this up since Wally can't attack right away. We'll still sometimes have to back up if I think Wally's about to shoot or to avoid his minions which will force us to readjust afterwards and sometimes result in us taking damage. The major upside to this strategy is that we can get one or two hits on Wally between his constant egg attacks. There's a very minor delay between each one you should use as your opportunity to move above or below him, so you don't have to move horizontally at all. Worst case scenario is you expect him to shoot earlier, but he waits until you're trapped at the top or bottom of the screen to fire directly into your cup face. Even with this slight risk, it makes getting all the 44 hits I need only take about a minute and 15 seconds instead of 10 minutes. After getting used to this strategy, I'm consistently able to get 2 hits per egg attack as long as I'm above or below Wally to avoid the next one, and a whopping 5 hits after his hand attack. Sometimes the minions will get in the way, so I have to prioritize dodging them in lieu of damage but I'm now able to quickly and consistently beat phase 1 without taking damage, which is great because phases 3 and 4 are my favorite to play, you might say. Phase 2 isn't easy either, but I'll take it over them any day that's not Thursday. You can get a few hits on him after the phase transition, but afterwards immediately back up so you have space to dodge his only attack this phase where he shoots his feathers out in all directions. Similar to the first phase, I actually recommend using the d-pad to move up and down with no variance. Then as soon as they stop, I use the joystick to move right in front of him to get two hits before backing up to repeat this process as many times as it takes. Sometimes I'll get there a bit too late and have to get 1 or even 0 hits, but we're playing the long game so just don't panic and we'll be fine. The minions can get in the way which can also take enough time to close that short gap where we can actually hit Wally. Without the threat of an egg being shot directly at you, I find this phase much easier to line up hits for, but at this point I've also had a lot more practice. After Wally realizes he ran out of feathers like 5 minutes ago, Willy will take his place. At first, his face seemed too chaotic to come up with a proper plan, but Willy actually changes how he moves depending on where you are on the screen compared to him. The reason this is so important is due to his only difficult attack to dodge, where he has a shield of spiky eggs around him that move quickly and constantly change their radius from Willy, where not shrinking especially sucks, since we have very little room for error. My plan is to mostly hug the left side of the screen to bait Willy into consistent patterns. I move to the bottom middle of the screen when he's on the right side so I can react to the eggs no matter where in their cycle they are. If they're opening up as he moves back to the left, I'll have an opportunity to go for a number of hits that depends on how long until the eggs completely close in. You can get up to like 5, but on average I get about 3. Missing even 1 causes Whetstone's cooldown to take too long where I'll miss out on another 2 hits. Changing my movement even a little could result in a butterfly effect where I'll get cornered and take damage. To mostly prevent this, if Willy's eggs close in when he's exactly right here, make a counterclockwise circle around him to keep him in this exploitable pattern. If the eggs are closed or closing when I'm in the middle of the screen, I need to back up and hug the left wall again in a way where I'm between the eggs to narrowly avoid them. 
Sometimes to avoid damage, I'll have to go into the egg shield only to immediately leave. Pausing helps make this consistent to dodge and can also be used when I get greedy for an extra hit. This makes the most common thing to take damage to in this phase actually be colliding into Willy himself, which makes sense considering how he moves in a wavy pattern. I don't really have any tips other than keep fighting him to get used to his movement. I got used to it enough that I would take 1 or 2 damage this phase on average, which is officially good enough. During this time, I found that you can get 1 or 2 hits on Wally before his eggs start orbiting him, but the minions often get in the way so I don't recommend forcing it. Oh yeah, he also shoots a parryable ball every once in a while, but that's like no issue for professional parriers such as myself. And for everyone else, but still. Once Willy is beaten, Wally makes a return for the fourth, final, and worst phase of the fight. Individually, his attacks aren't too bad, but who said he'd be using them individually? The main problem here is that the bluebirds always fire one after the other for the entire phase with a pellet that splits into two pieces and gets shot at where the player was when this happens. While this is going on, Wally switches between his two attacks. His first has him spit out garbage in an arc for a while. This wouldn't be realistic to dodge consistently enough to get the 55 hits we need without pausing, so get used to seeing the pause screen a lot during this phase. Sometimes we can just back up, but other times we'll have to go between two pieces of garbage moving in unpredictable ways if we get unlucky. His other attack has him spit out his heart, which also spits out three pellets at different heights twice. This is only hard to dodge if you don't keep track of which bluebird is about to fire a pellet and where said pellet homes in on. While out, this gains Wally's heart box while the rest of his body loses it. You can hit the heart with whetstone if you wait for it to be spit out while you're to the left of it so it turns that way to shoot, only for you to quickly move to the right side for a safe hit. But that's a lot less consistent than the other way to hit him so I just don't go for it. Speaking of hitting the boss, it's been a very short while since one has had a terrible hitbox that prevented us from going for what would have been an easier and consistent hit. For some reason, the hitbox for his feet is huge, which rules out the otherwise easy hit between the bluebird and Wally's feet as our go-to strategy, even though a whetstone hit there is still possible. Hitting him from below the stretcher on the right side to avoid his garbage would have been funny, but not as funny as this hitbox. That leaves our only option for a consistent hit being below the stretcher on the left. You know where all the trash arcs into, haha. <laughs> In order to hit him, we need to pay attention to which direction the stretcher is moving as it always bounces quickly off the sides of the screen. The only time it stops moving is during the heart attack so it can re-enter his body. But since we can't hit him during it, all this does is gives us some time to move down to prepare for a hit as long as we have room and aren't dodging something else. I always need to keep in mind which bluebird is about to fire and which attack Wally's about to use so I can bait the pellet into a safe spot to dodge or let me go for a hit. The worst attack for this is definitely the garbage one since it's the most random with how each piece gets spit out. It also leaves the screen at the same point I need to use whetstone so I usually can't get any damage in myself during it. This mostly leaves my options to attack right before he uses it, or right after the heart attack. Even if everything lines up, the stretcher needs to be moving to the right, or only just start moving the left so I can escape in time. Since it moves so fast, we can only go for about 3 hits at most before having to leave due to the stretcher otherwise trapping us in a very small part of the screen for a pellet or other attack to hit me. Some of my attacks will also be cut short if I know the left bird will shoot a pellet as soon as I go over them. Even though this phase is his hardest, I don't have much else to say about it other than practice and get ready for a lot of variance with his attacks until you get good enough for this to happen.
Ooh, oh my god! Two HP, baby! Oh my god! Um. Um. Uh, salt and pepper will make this victory taste even better. That's the that's the death quote, baby, or the victory quote. I mean, let's go! <laughs> oh my God, two HP! Let's, let's go, dude. How is that a two HP victory? That is the second hardest boss in the game. For so far for this challenge. <laughs> Woo! Give me a so oh, I just need a second. Let's just say Wally's not the only one with the heart attack, you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? Woo! Wally's a hard boss, with the only easy phase being the first one, after finding a good strategy for it, but the rest of the fight being pretty bad. Sure, I won with two health, but that was a mistake. I, I don't know how that happened. I probably cheated. Funhouse Frazzle is much harder than Funfair Fever. There are just too many points where you're basically guaranteed to get hit or want the invincibility from taking damage. The main culprits were the three tubas who you can wait to strike seven times, but the jacks that constantly spawn force you to whetstone them, pairing you right into the tuba's attack. The other two tubas are in even worse spots, so you basically need to damage boost through them. Since we usually take damage somewhere else in the level and don't need whetstone here, we'll want twin hearts to have 5 health total. This requires us to go through the open mouth of the two mouth walls, which will sometimes result in taking damage, but we only need to get through one without taking damage to finish the level with one health. Now that all four of the other Isle 2 bosses have finally been bonked, the only boss remaining is Grim Matchstick. The good news is, I was right about him being tougher than Wally. The bad news is... He's... Tougher than Beppy. Yeah... This match will get red hot! Phase 1 isn't what makes this fight hard. Although, it is a pretty long phase, gatekeeping a decent attempt where I get to phase 2 by about 3 minutes, and that's only on a perfect no damage phase 1. Any damage taken here is an automatic restart. Trust me, your sanity will thank you once you get to phase 3. Grim's attacks in this phase are a 3 ringed beam that he'll shoot 2-3 to three times, with the last one being parryable. I usually try to parry it when possible to have more movement options at any given time, since without dashing, we're completely at the will of RNG cloud patterns. If Grim uses this attack, or is about to use this attack, I back up to consistently avoid it and move between clouds on different elevations to always have a safe escape. His other attack has him spit out fireballs in a wavy pattern. Before he reaches the damage threshold where his tail attacks you, he'll only fire one at a time. Once he does, however, two can be shot out at once and intercept each other, making the attack more difficult to dodge. I usually avoid this by being on a cloud at the top to just jump over the higher fireballs, or sometimes go between them if I don't have anywhere else to go. Pausing often helps with the latter. His tail will start appearing at the bottom of the screen after 12 whetstone hits, and without it getting in the way, those first 12 hits are pretty free. Between attacks, you can get two safe hits as long as you have clouds to land back on, all you need to avoid is his mouth's hitbox, which is pretty easy. If you're greedy, it's possible to get a third hit and back off right before he shoots his first I-beam, or wait for him to pull back to charge up a fireball and hit his moved hit slash hurt box. The I-beam hit is much riskier, so I don't recommend it, but the fireball hit is very consistent and even allows you to get another hit in between fireballs as long as the tail isn't in the way. Once the tail starts appearing, I play a lot safer and stay back if I know it's about to enter the screen. This way, I'll always have room to move between it, the clouds, and whatever attack Grim's doing. This is where you'll also want to take advantage of Grimm's attack pattern, almost always switching between his two attacks. 
Although, keep in mind that he rarely uses the same attack twice in a row, so if that would ever put you in a bad situation, just back up and play it safe by missing out on an attack or two. It's worth mentioning that damage from this phase carries over to the second one, and Grim can't progress phases if he's in the middle of an attack, so you can count 41 hits to make you one away from phase two and stop hitting Grim. Wait until he just starts using the fireball attack, since this gives you the most opportunities to hit him, and just keep going until he moves off screen. Although this is optimal, I personally find it too tedious, keeping in mind that it prevents me from talking or reading chat much on stream, and most attempts have me take damage somewhere in this phase anyway, forcing me to restart, which makes it feel even worse to lose. Phase 2 is one of the hardest phases we've seen so far in this challenge, and I'd love to say it's the reason this fight is the hardest one yet, but that honor belongs to Phase 3. Yes, I think it's worse than Beppy Phase 3, so it's super funny that there's another really difficult phase right before the worst one. In this phase, Grim is on the left side of the screen, summoning fireboys that walk along his tongue and lunge at the player. We'll talk about this funny attack later. We've got bigger issues right now. Namely, hitting the dang boss, I mean jeez. At first, I thought my only chance to hit him was to wait for fire to stop shooting from his nostrils, then going for a hit on his back. This strategy was terrible, however. Since the smoke from the nostrils still damages you for some reason, greatly reducing our window for a safe hit. The other major flaw with this plan is the Cloud RNG. I've already touched a bit on how annoying Cloud RNG is in the first phase, but in each phase it gets so much worse than the last. Here, we need clouds to align to be close enough to attack right as the smoke goes down, and then another cloud to land on to so you don't just fall into Grim's hitbox, adding a lot more RNG to every single hit. Thankfully, I found a much more consistent strategy, and I definitely don't have to do something similar in Phase 3. <sighs> Instead of going behind Grim and his nostrils, fall down a cloud and parry off of his mouth. This is much easier said than done, but it's also significantly better than whatever I was doing before. The main issue with this strategy is the jumping fireballs. Not only are they already one of the most difficult attacks in the game to dodge in general, but they almost perfectly counter our offensive strategy. The best way to dodge them is to only go for attacks while one isn't launching or already jumping at you. I usually split my focus between Mugman, Clouds, and Grim's Tongue. Once you hear Focus your attention on that fireball so you can see which direction it's facing. This will tell you which direction it will jump so you can dodge accordingly. The most common and safe dodge you'll do is being on top of a cloud and jumping towards the direction the fireball is coming from, which will almost always give you ample time to get completely out of its way no matter the random arc of the fireball's jump. If you're on the middle or bottom clouds, this is usually good enough to get by too, but there are some dangerous situations where predicting the wrong jump arc from the fireballs will get you hit. So of course, we'll be playing around that as much as we can. Pausing usually helps you dodge no matter the arc, but if we're on the bottom, sometimes all you can do is duck under a fireball's jump. I recommend staying cautious about being on the bottom, since sometimes a cloud will be just low enough for a fireball's hitbox to graze you without it even jumping. The most common way to get hit by these dudes is right before or after pairing off of Grim. If they're feeling extra mean, they'll lunge right as you drop down a cloud, and sometimes you'll have no other option than to whetstone Grim to not fall off screen. Right after a whetstone hit, the small arc can parry you onto a middle or bottom cloud without enough distance or options to reliably dodge fireballs, so always be ready to adapt to the situation when going for attacks. Speaking of attacks, there are two main types of attacks we use here. The most common is falling down from a cloud above Grim's mouth and parrying off of it. 
The second type, that I only go for when the clouds align, is a short hop from a bottom cloud. After enough practice, I reset if I take more than one damage on this phase. Though at the end, I started resetting when taking any damage sometimes, since phase 3 is bad. Really bad. But we're finally done with phase 2. Oh, I should probably talk about that. As soon as Grim transitions from phase 2 to 3, the mouth hitbox moves forward a bit. I don't actually know why it does that, since he has a hit slash hurt box behind him during this phase anyway, but weird hitboxes aren't really a surprise at this point, I guess. At least you can avoid this by keeping track of how many hits you've gotten on Grim for phase 2, and making sure that the final one puts you on a cloud above it, or you can jump over it if you've got enough room. The upside to this is you can get about 4 hits on the moved hurt box, but I actually preferred not risking it since it doesn't have a good visual cue and cloud RNG more often than not got in the way. Now that we're officially in phase 3, the real challenge begins. Grim still has his hurt box next to his bottom head, but getting clouds in the right spot while avoiding his heads and attacks is way too inconsistent to consider. So we'll take the marginally better option in the hurt box behind Grim. What sucks so much about this, or well, one of the many things that sucks so much about this, is we're completely reliant on cloud RNG. In order to hit Grim without taking damage from one of their heads, you need to jump from a cloud that's high enough on screen. Then you've got to land back on it before it gets too far away, which is pretty tight without the safety net of a dash. When doing the hit, the best visual cue is behind the top head size, but keeping in mind that the heads constantly move, it's mostly something you'll just practice and get a feel for. You can also use tape strats like I did with Beppy, but I stopped doing that since I had to keep taking it off and putting it back on. Yeah, this fight took a while to beat. Needing to get good cloud RNG and a couple of precise jumps makes this hit hard enough that I take damage sometimes, but the worst part about this phase is undoubtedly Grim's attacks. Their main attack is shooting out fire orbs. What makes this so bad is that we're still reliant on clouds to jump between to dodge these. You'll have to pay close attention to where the clouds are so you can decide the best route to take. This means you'll always need to keep in mind where you can safely jump to as soon as a fire orb gets shot to your current location. So if Grim shoots while you're on top, you'll usually want to fall back down to a lower cloud and make your way back up as they can shoot fire orbs almost back to back if they feel like it. Sometimes you'll have no choice but to jump towards Grim when they're about to shoot if the cloud you're standing on is going off screen, so just try to make it as short a hop as you can, or ideally prevent that situation from occurring if possible. The back-to-back -back shots are the worst case scenario, and you'll usually have to go between them or back off from your jump entirely. If you're in a position where you have no other choice, you can parry off of an orb, but this will cause it to explode in the four cardinal directions and likely hit you or put you in a bad position. Their other attack has Grim's middle head become a flamethrower and after a short delay, shoot it two times. This one is pretty easy to dodge. The only thing to look out for is to pay attention to where the clouds are since if you're not careful, you could be on a cloud moving off screen and realize too late you have nowhere to go as you can't always jump from one cloud to another without dashing. You can also stand on a bottom cloud safely, and sometimes ducking on a middle cloud is safe too. The worst part about this phase is that it's completely random if we'll be able to go for an attack, which we exclusively go for when Grim's using the flamethrower attack, as they can't shoot fire orbs directly into your mug head during this time. I don't know the average, and I really don't feel like counting it or looking at Grim ever again, but I'd guess I could only go for an attack roughly every 3 or 4 flamethrower cycles, making this phase so long and difficult. And of course, the longer it goes on, the higher chance of getting bad RNG or just simple human error. 
And there is no better feeling in this world than taking damage 30 minutes into a fight, only to realize you're just halfway through the hardest phase. But there really isn't much else to talk about, as this phase is mostly about endurance, and near the end becomes more about not losing your mind than gameplay, so let's skip to the part where I slay the dragon. I was way up. I cannot have four hits left or three hits left. No way! The dragon is dragon, baby! No way! I was so up! Why was I so. We did it! Okay, predictions for time. I'm gonna say 61 minutes and 12 seconds. Let's go! Oh my god, we did! Wait, was I the only one up there? What the heck? I was so up! I was, I was like, when I got hit the second time, um, that was like a really dumb, like, my bad. I was like hallucinating that late into the fight. Like, I was thinking there were clouds where there weren't clouds. And like... <laughs> Like, I was genuinely going insane. I didn't say anything, because then you guys would have known. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> what are some other lines? We've got time. We'll be here for a while. Anyone else got some lines? Some, some comebacks? Oh my god. I can't I was so off. Why was I so off? Was anyone else off who just watched history? <laughs> Oh my god, few years time? Yeah, maybe. Maybe we'll break the timer. That knockout scared me. I haven't heard that sound in a long time. Bro, I was terrified. I was literally, like, the reason I got hit the second time too is like when you're this far into like a good attempt, it, suddenly everything itches. Like your eyes itch, your arm itches. It's just like, and then you just notice every every part of your body, and you're like, oh, that, that oh, I got a blink. Oh, better remember to do that. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, I'd keep the fight going, but I didn't want it to drag on. Thanks, I, I whoever said that. Uh, random words, welcome. A lot of people just showing, <laughs> I guess, because that was a. Uh, did you guys like the me not talking attempt? Okay, um, so it was longer than an hour. So I'd say um, I I was very justified in going insane. 68 minutes and 26 seconds. I hope that'll be the longest time. Uh, let's hope so. What do you think? Well, thank you so much, Joseph, for the $9.99. This deserves a donation. Thank you so much. And hey, I can use the new YouTube feature fan funding to thank the people I missed. Um, Grover, thanks for gifting another membership. Who got it? Spartan, welcome to stream. Thanks for a $2 donation. Let's go. Oh my god. I can't believe it's over. Oh my god. November Joy, thank you so much for the $10. Hard to believe I was here. Take this for the unforgettable experience. Yeah, I'm not... I'm not gonna forget that one. Oh my god. You know what? Grim's earned it. He's more Beppy than Beppy himself. Thanks for watching. If you want to see the IL-3 video, like, a year from now probably, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. I'll be streaming IL-3 bosses after this video goes up, so if you're interested in seeing that, maybe turn on notifications, because boy do I not have a streaming schedule.